the volume if it's full hmm? volume is full unmute unmute الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network that is the Peace TV English the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, as well as the Peace TV Chinese, as well as the people watching us on the various social media platforms, that is YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God be upon all of you. Inshallah, we will be starting with the session Ask Dr. Dhakir and his son Farik. Inshallah, we will be starting with Season 4, Session 2. And Inshallah, I will respond to the questions that you have posed. Before we start the session, I would like to comment on the caricatures that were made of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in France. In the name of freedom of speech, President Macron promoted caricatures of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that were offensive to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For years, France has demonized its Muslim minorities. And the murder of Samuel Paty was another opportunity that President Macron seized to advance his campaign against the Muslims. We Muslims, we need to rise to the occasion and defend our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and portray and promote his true treatings to the world, his true message to the world, and show the world who our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, really was. I understand we Muslims, we are angry, upset, and sad, and we ought to be angry. Because if we don't, our Iman, it will be in question. But this emotion of anger and sadness, we need to channelize it in the right direction. I therefore suggest three important points. The first, I urge myself and all the brothers and sisters to present our best version of being Muslims and to be good practicing Muslims because whether or not consciously or unconsciously we are representing our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and the Islamophobes they think that the Prophet of Islam he is like he was like us that's the reason they mock at us therefore we Muslims we need to grow and we need to increase our Iman the second is that we need to respond to this in a logical and rational manner. We need to boycott all French products and services. The third, I request all brothers and sisters to read the translation of the glorious Quran and to read the biography of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, especially the non-Muslims. And the same breath, I request President Macron to read the translation of the glorious Quran and to read the biography of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. To hate a person without knowing him, it is injustice. Rather, it is bigotry. And what shocks me in France is that the head of state he says and he does certain things, but he does not realize that it is not only representing himself, but he is rather representing the whole country. 
our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was a mercy to the entire humanity. In the name of freedom of speech, if insulting our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is correct, would the head of state agree with someone insulting him? Would the head of state agree with someone insulting his mother, with someone insulting his father? This is not freedom of speech. In freedom of speech, you cannot insult or hurt the sentiments of others. And non-Muslims, they have praised our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have the example of La Martin. He says that if greatness of purpose, smallness of means and astounding results are the three criteria to judge a man's genius, who can dare to compare himself to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But sadly, Mr. Macron, he has not understood this. Non-Muslims, they revered and respected our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So let's start with the session. Let's take the first question. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Ayman. I am a student and I am from Kashmir. Are there any situations in which backbiting is allowed in Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Hujura, chapter number 49, verse number 12. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu jitanibu kathiran min al-dhan, inna ba'd al-dhan ni ithm. O you who believe, avoid suspicion, for suspicion in most cases is a sin. وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا And do not despise each other. And do not backbite each other. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلْ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُوهُ Would any of you like to eat the meat of your dead brother? You would deny it. So backbiting, it is prohibited in Islam. But there are certain situations in which the scholars, they have said that backbiting, it is permitted. And inshallah, I will discuss six situations in which backbiting, it is permitted. The first is that when you're complaining regarding someone, if someone has done something bad to you, if he has robbed you, if he has cheated you, if he has lied to you, so you complain to the ruler or to the judge regarding this person. So in this situation, backbiting, it is permitted. The second is warning the people regarding a particular person. For example, someone is involved in robbing, in cheating, in deceiving. He's involved in something that is a bidah. He's involved in shirk. So you warn the people to stay away from such a person. The third is inquiring regarding someone. For example, if you want to do business with someone so you inquire regarding this person regarding his character whether his character is good or no whether he's involved in cheating if he's an honest person because you are going to deal with this person so you inquire regarding this person you inquire regarding a dai for example if you want to listen to him if you want to gain knowledge from him so you inquire whether this dai he is on the quran and sunnah He's following the Quran, sun, Quran and Sunnah or no? You inquire regarding a scholar if he is on the correct Aqeedah, if he's following the Quran and Sunnah or no? So when you want to inquire regarding someone and if you want, for example, your sister, she wants to get married and you come across certain person, you come across a, a person and you want to inquire regarding his character, whether he's good or no, whether he offers salah, whether he cheats, whether he's a good person, whether he's a bad person, whether he smokes, etc. Because your sister is going to get married to this person. So you need to inquire regarding the negative traits, regarding the character of this person. So in these situations, backbiting, it is permitted. The fifth is that you warn 
the people regarding a public figure. For example, if a public figure, he is involved in something that is haram, he is involved in some bidah, he is promoting shirk. So you warn the people that they should stay away from this person. And the sixth is that you ask a scholar regarding someone. For example, you have a family dispute, you have a family argument. So you ask the scholar regarding this person. So you ask the scholar a fatwa or an opinion regarding this family dispute. And you need to explain the family dispute. So you need to mention the bad things or the bad points that this person has done to you. So in this situation, backbiting, it is permitted. And also it is permitted when the judge asks you regarding a person. And you need to speak the truth regarding a witness, for example. Is he involved? Is this witness a good person? Is his character good? Is he honest? So you need to speak the truth. If this witness is his character good or is his character bad? So in these situations, backbiting, it is permitted. So there are six situations in which backbiting it is permitted. The first is when you want to complain regarding someone, if he's done something bad to you. The second is warning the people regarding someone if he's involved in something bad, if he's a robber, if he's a cheater, if he's involved in some bidah, if he's involved in shirk. The third is inquiring regarding someone. The fourth is the asking when the judge asks you regarding someone, for example, a witness. So you tell regarding this person. The fifth is warning the people regarding a public figure if he's involved in something bad or if he's promoting some bidah or something that is involving into shirk. And the sixth is asking a scholar regarding a family dispute or any opinion asking his fatwa. So in these situations, backbiting, it is permitted. The next question, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Akib Zaman, I am from Assam, India. My question is, what is the difference between Sadaqa and Zakah? The word Zakah, it means to purify or it means growth. Now before we discuss the difference between Sadaqa and between Zakah, let us talk about the importance of Zakah. Zakah, it is the third pillar of Islam and it is the obligatory charity. Every rich person who has a saving of more than the Nisab level, he should give 2.5% of his saving every lunar year in charity. That is if anyone has his wealth reaches more than the Nisab level of more than 85 grams of gold, he should give 2.5% of his saving every lunar year in charity. Now let's discuss the differences between zakah and between sadaqa. There is an important point that I would like to mention that every zakah it is I would like to mention the difference between zakah and sadaqa. But before that I would like to mention every zakah it is sadaqa but every sadaqa it is not zakah. Every zakah is sadaqah that is obligated to charity, but every sadaqah charity, it is not zakah. So zakah, it is one type of sadaqah that is charity. So charity, sadaqah, it is general charity, whereas zakah, it is specific obligatory charity. Now let's discuss the difference between sadaqah and between zakah. The first is that zakah, it is the obligatory charity, whereas sadaqah, it is voluntary and it is not obligatory. The second is that zakah, it has a specific percentage. Most of the cases, it is 2.5% of your wealth that you need to give as zakah. Whereas sadaqah, it does not have a specific percentage and you can give as much as you want. The third is that zakah is given every lunar year, once every lunar year. Whereas sadaqah can be given once, twice, three times, as many times as you wish. The fourth is that zakah is given only to certain categories of people. Only these categories of people can be given zakah. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا Many a times the word sadaqah, it is used in the glorious Quran, and it refers to as zakah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا That zakah is to be given to the fuqara, to the poor people, وَالْمَسَاكِينَ and to the needy. وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا And those entitled to collect zakah, the zakah collectors. وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ And those whose hearts are inclined towards Islam. وَفِي الرِّقَابِ And the freeing of slaves. وَالْغَارِمِينَ And those in debt. وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبْنِ السَّبِيلِ And the stranded traveler. So these are eight categories of people who you can give zakah. So only these eight categories of people can be given zakah, whereas sadaqah can be given to any human being. The fifth is that zakah can only be given to Muslims. There is one category of zakah which can be given to non-Muslims. That is mu'allafati qulubhum, those whose hearts are inclined towards Islam, whereas Generally, zakah can only be given to Muslims, whereas sadaqah can be given to anyone, to Muslims, to non-Muslims, to your relatives, to the needy, to the rich, to the poor, anyone, you can give sadaqah. The sixth is that there is a prescribed punishment for those people who do not give zakah. And if you do not give zakah, when you are capable of giving zakah, it is a major sin. And even according to Imam al-Dahabi, he writes in his book Al-Kabai, The 70 Major Sins, he says that if you can give zakah, if you are capable of giving zakah, and if you do not give zakah, then it is a major sin, and it is the fifth major sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34 and 35, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ And those who hoard gold and silver and do not give it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So give them glad tidings of a painful punishment. يَوْمَ يُحْمَا عَلَيْهَا فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمْ فَتُكْوَى بِهَا جِبَاهُهُمْ وَجُنُوبُهُمْ وَظُهُورُهُمْ هَذَا مَا كَنَسْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ فَذُوقُوا مَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْنِزُونَ On that day, when these treasures will be converted into fire and it will be given to them. And it will be given to them and it will reach their foreheads, their sides as well as their backs. And it will be said to them, this is the wealth that you would hold. So taste what you would hold. So if you do not give zakah, when you have the capability of giving zakah, it is a major sin and there is a prescribed punishment for it. Whereas if you do not give sadaqah, there is no prescribed punishment for it. In fact, if you give sadaqah, you will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you do not give it, there is no sin upon you. And the seventh difference, the last difference that we will discuss is that zakah, most cases, cannot be given that zakah cannot be given to the ascendants and the descendants. The ascendants, that is your father, your mother, your grandfather, your grandmother, and the descendants, that is your children and their children. These people, they cannot be given zakah. Whereas sadaqah can be given to your ascendants, to your descendants, to your relatives. Sadaqah can be given to anyone. So these were seven differences that I mentioned between zakah and between sadaqah. The next question, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abdul Ilahi Abdul Rahman from Somalia. How do you reply to non Muslims who are atheists when they ask who created Allah? Many of the atheists they ask this question that who created Allah? 
And there is a common strategy that is used by many of the Muslims when they try to prove regarding the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they are talking to the atheist, they ask the atheist that who created the table? Who created the chair? So the atheist says the manufacturer, the carpenter has created the table, the carpenter has created the chair. They further ask who has created the mobile phone for example. So the atheist says the manufacturer. They later on, who, they later on ask who has created the sun, the moon, the stars. All things have to have a creator and they say that everything has a creator. So now this atheist in this situation, he asks this Muslim that if everything has a creator, will you agree with the statement and will you stick to the statement? So the Muslim, generally the Muslim, he thinks that he has almost convinced the atheist regarding the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he tells the atheist that yes, I will stick to my statement that everything has a creator. Now this atheist, he will ask this non-Muslim or generally he asks the non-Muslim that if everything has a creator, then who created God? And the Muslim will get trapped in this situation. So that's the reason when we are doing dawah, we should be very careful of our statements. That's the reason when I do dawah, what I prefer, I ask the atheist. For example, who created the table? Who created the chair? So he will say the carpenter. He will say the manufacturer. Then I ask him who created the sun, the moon, etc. And I will tell this atheist that every created thing has a creator. And Almighty God, he is uncreated. Almighty God, by definition, he is uncreated. And when I'm doing dawah to the atheist, when we are doing dawah to the atheist, we should ask this atheist a simple question. That, for example, my friend John told me that his brother Tom gave birth to a child. That is, Tom gave birth to a child. This child is the child a boy or a girl? I'm asking the question that Tom gave birth to a child. Is this child a boy or a girl? The point to be noted is that a man cannot give birth to a child. So the question itself, it is illogical and it is incorrect. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by definition, he is uncreated. So the question itself, it is illogical and it is incorrect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran Surah Ikhlas chapter number 112 verse number 4 وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدْ And there is nothing like unto him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by definition he is uncreated. The next question. My name is Abdullah from New York. How can Islam be called a religion of peace when it was spread by the sword? Islam comes from the root word salam which means peace. It is also derived from the Arabic word silm which means to submit your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each and every human being is not in the favor of maintaining peace. There are many who would want to disrupt it for their own personal gain. This is precisely the reason we have the police who sometimes uses force so that peace and justice will prevail. Islam promotes peace and justice, but in certain situations, force can be used so that peace and justice will prevail. And in order to fight oppression, force can be used. So in Islam, force is used as a last resort so that peace and justice will prevail. And the best reply to the misconception that Islam was spread by the sword is given by the famous historian Dilasi O'Leary in his book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8. He says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. 
I would like to repeat the statement Delassie O'Leary in his book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8 he says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. We Muslims we ruled Spain for 800 years we didn't do our job. Later on, the Christian crusaders came and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the adhan that is a call for prayer. We Muslims, we were the lords of Arabia for 1400 years. For a few years, the French came. For a few years, the British came. But overall, we Muslims, we were the lords of Arabia for 1400 years. Yet today in Arabia, there are no less than 9 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christians means Christians since generations. These 9 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians, they are giving Shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was not spared by the sword. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia which has the maximum number of Muslims, which has more than 85% Muslims, which has no less than 220 million Muslims? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia which has more than 60% Muslims? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? The reply is given by Thomas Carlyle in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship. The sword indeed, but where will you get your sword? Every new idea originates in the mind of one. One man against the whole world that he will pick up his sword and propagate it. You must pick up your sword and propagate. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sword of intellect. The sword of reasoning, the sword which conquers the hearts and minds of people. Even if we had the sword of metal and steel, we could not use it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, La din. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Thomas Carlyle was talking about the sword of intellect, the sword of reasoning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nahl chapter 16 verse number 125 Invite to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. And there was an article published in the Reader's Digest, Almanac, Yearbook 1984 which showed the increase of the major world religions in the span of 50 years from 1934 to 1984 and number one religion was Islam which increased by 235 percent Christianity only 47 percent which war took place between 1934 to 1984 which forced millions of people to accept Islam which war today the fastest growing religion in America is Islam the fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam which sword is forcing Tens of thousands of Americans to accept Islam. Tens of thousands of Europeans to accept Islam. The media says that Islam subjugates the woman. You know, out of those people accepting Islam, two-thirds of them, they are women. Which sword is forcing these American and European women to accept Islam? And people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of the religion of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. We will take the last question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ridwan from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and I am an IT executive by profession. Can you explain if the name Allah is mentioned in other religious scriptures? The word Allah is mentioned in the Bible as well as in the Hindu scriptures. It's mentioned in the Bible in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, as well as in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was put on the cross, he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. O God, O God, why hast thou forsaken me? And many of the Christians, they say that Jehovah is one of the names of Almighty God. Does Ella Ella Lama Sabakhtani sound similar to Jehovah Jehovah why has thou forsaken me? But natural no. Does it sound similar to Jesus Jesus why has thou forsaken me? 
but natural no ellai ellai lama sabaktani if you translate into arabic it is allah allah lama taraktani o oh god o oh god why hast thou forsaken me and even in the hindu scriptures the name of allah subhanahu wa taala it is mentioned there is a upanishad by the name of aldo upanishad and allah subhanahu wa taala he is mentioned in the hindu scriptures by the name allah by the word allah it's mentioned in rigved book number 2 hymn number 1 verse number 11 as well as in rigved book number 3 hymn number 30 verse number 11 so allah subhanahu wa taala he is mentioned in the bible as well as in the christian script as well as in the hindu scriptures this was the time that we had today and inshallah the remaining part of the session will be continued by my father i would like to end this session wa akhiru da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alamin